Hey guys, welcome back. Part two here of the next presidential series installment, taking a look at the 22nd and 24th president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. So I'm going to jump right in here. As I said, I am flying solo for the audio portions of this uh, Cleveland video. Um, so we'll jump right in. Good old Grover the Good, as he was nicknamed. Uh, let me see where I can start here. Where would be a good starting point to kind of kick things off? Um, well, I think probably the best thing to really get to is uh, the fact that, you know, Grover Cleveland, he was known as a very honest politician. Uh, Cleveland became an active member of the Democratic Party in New York, making a name for himself while fighting against corruption. Uh, in 1882, as I said in part one, he was elected as the mayor of Buffalo and then the governor of New York, and he had made many enemies for his action against crime and dishonesty, and this would later hurt him when he came up for re-election, actually. Um, you know, there was a lot of, you know, big-time titans of industry. Uh, you know, our, our country and our nation uh, was becoming, you know, for probably about roughly 10 years or so at this point, um, becoming very industrialized. You know, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, you know, the people like that of the country. They were very, very rich, very powerful men. Uh, and you had, you started to really see a lot of factions of, you know, big money, uh, big wealthy money interests that were obviously taking part in American politics. And as we know from present day politics all the way up to, uh, you know, you can go back for the last hundred years or so. Um, it's, it does, you know, whether it's unfortunate or not, it does play a big role in uh in, in american politics so um he he was known though as, as taking kind of taking some of these people head on uh he was a pretty honest guy overall um so th that's one thing about it um obviously the very contentious election of 1884 uh cleveland was nominated as the democratic candidate for president in 1884 his opponent was republican james blaine during the campaign, the Republicans tried to use Cleveland's past involvement with a lady by the name of Maria C. Halpin against him. Maria Halpin had given birth to a son in 1874 and named Cleveland as the father. He agreed to pay child support, eventually paying for him to be put into an orphanage. The Republicans used this in their fight against him, but Cleveland did not run from the charges and his honesty when dealing with the issue was well received by the voters. In the end, Cleveland had won the election with only 49% of the popular vote and 55% of the electoral vote. We'll get into that more in a minute here. Uh, but yes, uh, pretty interestingly enough, uh, Grover Cleveland, he, uh, a lot of people don't know it, but he was kind of involved in, in a big time uh, sex scandal, so to speak. Um, really interesting, to be honest with you. Um, you know, he, as I said, he may have fathered an illegitimate child, uh, in one of the biggest sex scandals in American history, uh, widow Maria Cross Halpin accused Grover Cleveland of illegitimately fathering her child, whose some surname was Cleveland, uh, and corrupting her morals, uh, according to her, of course, um, Republicans seized upon the allegation, allegations, hoping they would ruin Cleveland's bid for the presidency in 1884. But Cleveland admitted to an affair and the possibility of the child being his own. He claimed paternity and began to pay child support, as I just touched on a minute ago. And it was a move that likely saved his campaign. Halpin had also accused uh, of Cleveland of raping her and committing her to a mental, mental institution to gain custody of their child. Although Cleveland's decision to support his child turned the tide of public opinion. These further accusations remain in question to this day. Um, so pretty interesting stuff there about Cleveland and this whole, uh, you know, scandal. Um, you know, it, it, it's pretty interesting. Actually, um, he did, like I said, he admitted that it was possible that it was his child. And actually, Grover Cleveland's law partner, Oscar Folsom may have also been the father. So there was kind of some controversy there. 
Um, and like I say, Cleveland's honestly helped to, to kind of blunt the scandal's impact. It really did. Um, so pretty interesting stuff. You know, it was the scandal was known as Mama, Where's My Pa? Uh, you know, that was kind of the name of the scandal. Uh, some papers and that sort of thing gave the scandal that name, Mama, Where's My Pa? Uh, that was a pretty interesting scandal at the time, there's no doubt. Um, so now I'm going to kind of touch on a little bit uh, before I get into really more of his presidency and that sort of thing. Um, just a little bit overview. Just I'm just going to give you a brief overview of his presidency, and then I'll really touch on some individual points of his presidency. So, uh, just to give you again a little brief overview of his presidency, and then we'll get into some real specifics. You know, the nation's attention would turn to a campaign so rife with partisan personal attacks that both candidates seemed equally repugnant. In 1884, 20 years after the end of the Civil War, most Americans shared one thing in common. They were reading newspapers. Their circulation for major publishing firms was 5 million, and there were small dailies aimed at the new immigration population. And they were all covering the upcoming presidential election. The media in 1884 was pretty much strictly partisan. There were Democratic papers, and there were Republican papers. Sound familiar, anyone? <laughs> there is also more and more inquiry into presidents' private lives at this point. And certainly, one of the most notable examples of this happens in 1884. Two weeks after the Democrats elected their presidential nominee, New York Governor Grover Cleveland, a man famed for battling political corruption in his home state, Given the nickname Grover the Good, Republican papers broke a story alleging that he had fathered a child out of wedlock. Grover the Good, as he was nicknamed, as I just said, the anti-corrupt politician known for being pug-ugly honest, was involved in perhaps the most notorious sex scandal in presidential history, with the exception, perhaps, of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Cleveland's opponent, opponent, Republican James G. Blaine, did not fare much better. It was an ugly campaign. Those people that believed Blaine was a crook, which, to be honest, he probably was, they were said to have gone through the streets chanting, Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, continental liar from the state of Maine. Cleveland squeaked into office. He took the pivotal state of New York by a mere 1,049 votes. But the bruising campaign left a definite mark on the office. From the 1884 election on, Cleveland hated the press. He considered them to be lowlives. He tightened up whenever they were around him. And it really impacted the way he ran the country. He is not a terribly effective, he's not terribly effective as president. Uh, in fact, his presidency is more remembered now that this bachelor president of immense physical presence married this very young woman, Frances Folsom, who was Cleveland's wife and first lady. And even though Cleveland was the first Democrat elected since the Civil War and his own party controlled Congress, the 22nd president introduced almost new, no new legislation, acting not as an inspiring leader, but as a federal spending watchdog. He vetoed giveaway pension bills. He vetoed high spending bills to provide seed for farmers in the drought-stricken area, uh, area of the West whose crops had failed. Yeah, and talk about vetoing. Talk about a man who was... Uh, what you would almost call veto happy, uh, Cleveland was crazy veto. He vetoed a lot. He was a very, very conservative Democrat. He was very fiscally conservative. He vetoed a lot. He actually vetoed 414 in his first term, which was the record at that point. Um, you know, his second term was miserable due to the country's economic troubles. We'll get into that in a minute. 
as I said, very, very anti-corruption. Of course, had you know the nickname because of that anti-corruption and honesty of Grover the Good. Uh, so, interestingly enough. So back to you know during his president, you know presidency, Congress was really setting the agenda. It wasn't a situation like we have now where you expect the president to have a legislative agenda. In this case, presidents were freq- frequently reactive. So when Cleveland ran for re-election in 1888, he won the popular vote by 100,000. But he lost in the electoral college count to Republican Benjamin Harrison, who was supported by special interests with deep pockets and a campaign that targeted key swing states with high numbers of delegates. You know, it all depends on where you put the votes. Cleveland didn't carry Indiana. He didn't carry New York. And that's really what decided it. Um, You know, Cleveland was defeated. But interestingly enough, as his first lady was packing up, she actually told a White House usher, make sure you don't break anything because we are coming back in four years. So pretty interesting little uh, fun fact about uh, what First Lady Cleveland said before they left the White House after their first term. Uh, With the bad taste of Benjamin Harris's Benjamin Harrison's presidency still lingering in their mouths, the American public did something unprecedented. They turned back to a previous president, making Francis Cleveland's promise to return reality. In the election of 1892, Grover Cleveland was re-elected and became the first and only president to serve two non-consecutive terms in office. And as part, and part of the reason for his uh, re-election, was the influence that Francis, his first lady, had over the American electorate. Um, The public's fascination with the now 24th president also extended to his infant daughter, Baby Ruth. She was said to be the inspiration for the candy bar, Baby Ruth. But Cleveland responded by biting the hand that fed him. He closed the grounds of the White House for the first time to keep crowds away. He wanted to focus on politics. But he soon regretted that decision. In the last weeks of Benjamin Harrison's presidency, the economy tanks and the stock market crashed. It leads to a Great Depression, just as Grover Cleveland is coming back in with a Democratic majority. Railroad overbuilding had led to an economic disaster. Major banks had failed. Nearly one-third of farmers held mortgages which foreclosed at record rates. Unemployment reached a new high at 18.4%. All classes of people were hit hard. Uh, Cleveland, unfortunately, he has no real response to an economic depression. He doesn't believe in government assistance. And it basically damages the Democratic Party quite seriously. And it's one of the reasons why the Cleveland administration falls apart. You know, toward the end of his second term as president, Cleveland was so irrelevant that when he disappeared for three weeks for surgery on a cancerous jaw, there was very little public outcry. Um, We're going to get into that about his surgery and everything here in a second. So that's just kind of a brief overview uh, of Cleveland, uh, just kind of a synopsis, if you will, uh, of his presidency. Um, So here we go. I'm going to kind of give you a little thing. um, Touching on about his uh, marriage to uh, Francis Folsom, Uh, Grover Cleveland was the first president to ever get married at the White House. He was elected to office while he was unmarried. He was a bachelor. And Grover Cleveland became the first president to actually get married at the White House while in office. His sister assumed the duties of first lady for the first two years of his term while Cleveland was single. However, in 1885, Cleveland met Francis Folsom, a student at Wells College. And the two married in the White House's Blue Room the next year. So, pretty interesting stuff. Um, Yeah. Yeah, When Cleveland, he was just 49 years old. He married Francis Francis Folsom at the White House. He was the only president to ever do so. They had five children total together. Their daughter, Esther Cleveland, was the only president's child to be born in the White House. Francis soon became quite an influential first lady. She set trends trends from hairstyles to clothing choices. Her image was often used without her permission to advertise many products. After Cleveland died in 1908, 
Francis Cleveland would be the first president's wife to actually remarry. So yeah, pretty interesting stuff about Cleveland and his wife uh, and his children and that sort of thing. So um, I don't know, pretty pretty cool stuff there. You know, as I touched on a little bit ago, you know, Grover Cleveland won the first presidential election by, I mean, literally the narrowest of margins. Uh, it was a win by just 1,200 votes in his adopted home state of New York. Uh, I said earlier, I think 1,400, but it was right around, it was, it was a low amount. It was less than 1,500 votes that swung the uh, 1884 election. Um, and then, as I said, in his re-election bid, uh, he lost, of course, but when he actually won his second election, uh, he won the second election in the popular vote by spending, by the Republicans, swing the electoral vote in New York State away from Cleveland. Uh, big spending, that is, by the Republicans, swing the uh, electoral vote in New York State away from Cleveland. And Benjamin Harris took the electoral college vote and the presidency. So that was one of the big things that happened in that Benjamin Harrison um, election when Cleveland lost. Uh, when he actually did win, I just misspoke a minute ago, but when he did win the second term, a third party really helped Cleveland get his second term. The populist party took 8% of the popular vote and Cleveland easily defeated Harrison in the 1892 rematch by a 277 to 145 margin in the electoral college. So third party, the populist party, that is the party, and that is what really helped get Cleveland, uh, you know, nominated for his uh, second term, um, interestingly enough. So pretty cool stuff there. Um, what else can I tell you about Cleveland here and presidency? There's a lot of things to really get into with his presidency. Uh, as we said, he served two non-consecutive term. He ran for the re-election in 1888, but the Tammany Hill group from New York City caused him to lose the presidency. When he ran again in 1892, they tried to keep him from winning again, but he managed to win by just 10 electoral votes. This would make him the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms, as, as we said. Um, interestingly enough, during his first campaign, this is interesting, and we did touch on this a little bit, Grover Cleveland ran in his first campaign as a reformer. He was dedicated to instituting change and nixing the rampant corruption in the government. One of his first actions as president was to disregard the spoil system of cabinet appointments. Instead of merely hiring friends and supporters, Grover Cleveland kept on staff the Republicans who were doing their jobs well and appointed others based on their actual work ethic and politics, not their party alliance. So that's really cool. You know, I mean, he was very, you know, bipartisan in that way. Uh, he didn't just give you know, jobs and favors to his buddies or the people who gave him money to run for president. So um, pretty cool stuff there. Um, let me think here now. Okay, we'll get into this. Uh, of course, we touched on this a little bit. Grover Cleveland's controversial vetoes. When Grover Cleveland was president, he received a number of requests from Civil War veterans for pensions. Cleveland took the time to read through each request vetoing any that he felt were fraudulent or lacking in merit. He also vetoed a bill that would allow disabled veterans to receive benefits no matter what caused their disability. Like I said, very, 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 very veto-happy uh, president he was. There's no doubt about that. Um, he vetoed an awful lot, especially in his first term. He was a very conservative Democrat, especially fiscally conservative. So... Anything that came to money or government spending of money, um, Grover Cleveland was not not for. He was not in favor of. Uh, he was he really was. He was quite. I mean, what we'd almost call frugal. You know, he he was not the the overspending type. Very 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 stingy in that regard. Grover Cleveland was. Um, the Presidential Succession Act. When James Garfield died, an issue with presidential succession was brought to the forefront. If the vice president became the president while the Speaker of the House and the president pro tempore of the Senate were not in session, there would be no one to take over the presidency if the new president passed away. So the Presidential Succession Act was passed and signed by Grover Cleveland that provided for a line of succession. So pretty interesting stuff there. He, he uh, signed that into, 
into law the Presidential Succession Act. That's something that Cleveland did. Another thing that Cleveland did was the Interstate Commerce Commission. In 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act was passed. This was the first federal regulatory agency. Its goal was to regulate interstate railroad rates. It required rates to be published, but unfortunately was not given the ability to enforce the act. Nevertheless, it was the first key step in controlling transportation corruption. So the Interstate Commerce Commission, another thing that Cleveland uh, did and uh, was a part of during his presidency is uh, two terms as president. Um, What else can I get into here? Uh, Cleveland was also opposed to imperialist intervention in foreign countries. He was an advocate for the gold standard and sought a reduction in tariffs as the U.S. government was running on a surplus due to exorbitant tariff revenue. However, despite his love affair with the power of veto and his formidable policymaking skills, Grover Cleveland also signed into law many policies that decimated indigenous communities and excluded minority groups. So, very interesting thing there. This is going to kind of make me touch on another thing of Cleveland's presidency, uh, which was um, Cleveland and his opposition of the uh, to the annexation of Hawaii after the Queen was overthrown at the end of the Harrison administration. Of course, it got annexed later on during the McKinley administration, but Cleveland comes off as the good guy for wanting to restore the indigenous queen. Um, pretty interesting stuff here, because I just, as I just read, there were certain things that Cleveland did that were not so good uh, toward indigenous uh, people and communities. Uh, but this is kind of an interesting thing regarding Cleveland and Hawaii and uh, indigenous, the indigenous queen and people there. Let me read a little bit more to you uh, about that. It was actually January 17th of 1893, to be exact, Americans overthrow Hawaiian monarchy. On the Hawaiian Islands, a group of American sugar planters under Sanford Ballard, uh, under Sanford Ballard Doyle overthrew Queen, Queen Lila, Lila Okalani, like maybe Lilai or Liloi Okalani, Okalani, Queen Lilia Okalani. Queen Lilia Okawani, the Hawaiian monarch, and establish a new provincial government with Dole as president. Uh, provincial gov- government where they were going to have uh, Sanford Ballard Dole as president. The coup occurred with the foreknowledge of John L. Stevens, the U.S. minister to Hawaii, and 300 U.S. Marines from the U.S. cruiser Boston were called to Hawaii allegedly to protect American lives. The first known settlers of the Hawaiian Islands were Polynesian voyagers who arrived sometime in the 8th century and in the early 18th century. The first American traders came to Hawaii to exploit the island's sandalwood, which was much valued in China at the time. In the 1830s, the sugar industry was introduced to Hawaii and by the mid-19th century had become well-established. American missionaries and planters brought about great changes in Hawaiian political, cultural, economic, and religious life. And in 1840, a constitutional monarchy was established, stripping the Hawaiian monarch of much of his authority. Four years later, Sanford B. Doyle was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, to American parents. During the next four decades, Hawaii entered to, into a number of political and economic treaties with the United States. And in 1887, a U.S. naval base was established at Pearl Harbor as part of a new Hawaiian constitution. Sugar exports to the United States expanded greatly during the next four years, and U.S. investors and American sugar planters on the islands broadened their domination over Hawaiian affairs. However, in 1891, Queen... Lila Lilo Kali Lila Kaliani Lila Kalani I'm butchering that I'm sure the sister of the late King Kalakai ascended to the throne refusing to recognize the constitution of 1887 and replacing it with a constitution increasing her personal authority 
In January of 1893, a Revolutionary Committee of Safety, organized by Sanford B. Doyle, staged a coup against the Queen with the tact support of the United States. On February 1st, Minister John Stevens recognized Doyle's new government on his own authority and proclaimed Hawaii a U.S. protectorate. The Doyle submitted a treaty of annexation to the U.S. Senate, but most Democrats opposed it, especially after it was revealed that most Hawaiians did not want annexation. President Grover Cleveland sent a new U.S. minister to Hawaii to restore the Queen to the throne under the 1887 Constitution, but Doyle refused to step aside and instead proclaimed the Independent Republic of Hawaii. Cleveland was unwilling to overthrow the government by force, and his successor, President William McKinley, negotiated a treaty with the Republic of Hawaii in 1897. In 1898, the Spanish-American War broke out, and the strategic use of the naval base at Pearl Harbor during the war convinced Congress to approve formal annexation. Two years later, Hawaii was organized into a formal U.S. territory, and in 1959, it entered the U.S. and the United States as the 50th state. So pretty interesting stuff. Cleveland uh, was a part of the whole Hawaii annexation uh, bit. Thought that was pretty interesting. So another thing to get into would be uh, the Panic of 1893. Soon after Grover Cleveland became president for the second time, the Panic of 1893 occurred. This economic depression resulted in millions of unemployed Americans. Riots occurred and many turned to the government for help. Cleveland agreed with many others that the government's role was not to help people harmed by the natural lows of the economy. As I said, he didn't believe in government assistance. During this era of unrest, laborers increased the fight for better working conditions. On May 11th of 1894, the workers at the Pullman Palace Car Company in Illinois walked out under the leadership of Eugene V. Debs. The resulting Pullman strike became quite violent, leading Grover Cleveland to order troops in to arrest Debs and other leaders. Another economic issue that occurred during Cleveland's presidency was the determination of how U.S. currency should be backed. Cleveland believed in the gold standard while others backed silver. Due to the passage of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act during Benjamin Harrison's time in office, Cleveland was concerned that gold reserves had dwindled, so he helped push the repeal of the act through Congress. Interestingly enough about Cleveland. Um, you know, it was a disaster. It struck during his presidency, the Panic of 1893. It rushed in a severe economic depression in which Cleveland was powerless to stop or reverse. As a result, the Republican Party gained a landslide in 1894, and Cleveland's version of the Democratic Party was effectively ruined. Cleveland also angered labor unions around the nation after he intervened in the Pullman strike, as I said, in Illinois and he forced railways to continue to operate despite the demands of their workers. So, um, interesting stuff about Cleveland, um, you know, and, and the, uh, the, the, the strike, so to speak. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. What else can I tell you, Cleveland here? Oh, Grover Cleveland lobbied for the Scott Act, which stated that any Chinese immigrant to the United States who left the country could not return to it. He viewed Native Americans as wards of the state and pushed for the Dawes Act, which encouraged total assimilation of Native American communities and ultimately weakened tribal governments. So pretty interesting stuff there about Cleveland and uh, Native Americans as well. Uh, Grover Cleveland, you know, he's really widely considered to be one of America's more successful, if average, leaders. Uh, while most scholars do not rank him among the upper echelons of U.S. presidents, his two terms were marked with strength and real change. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting when it comes to Cleveland. I don't know where to put him. Of course, I have a little bit of a bias, as we know, um, you know. It's tough to say. It really is. Uh, Grover Cleveland, he actually won the popular vote in his unsuccessful 1896 re-election campaign. While much attention has been brought in recent years to the disparities between electoral and popular vote counts, 
Grover Cleveland was one of the first to lose election, his election due only to the Electoral College. That was in 1888. Cleveland was defeated by Republican Benjamin Harrison, as we said. Um, Harrison's victory was solely based on electoral votes in three swing states. Although Cleveland had won the majority in the popular vote, voter fraud was later discovered in Indiana. Despite this, Cleveland accepted the result without complaint. Um, interestingly enough there. Uh, again, you know, he does. He gets mixed grades as a president. Historians rank Cleveland as an average president at his best in the same category as people like Chester Arthur and Benjamin Harrison. Cleveland gets credit for restoring the power of the presidency in the 1880s. But Cleveland's misunderstandings about political systems and economic depression in 1893 saw Cleveland's Democrats lose power quickly and his political career end, really. It's, again, where do I put him? I don't know. I don't know. It's tough to say. It really is. Um, I don't know where to put him. I would put him in the middle. I think he's probably more like a C plus or a B minus kind of president. I definitely don't think he's A tier or B plus tier, but I don't necessarily think he's D tier uh, as well. I think he's really kind of in the middle, maybe in the upper echelon of the middle average presidents, to be honest. And that's not just my bias coming through of the New Jersey thing, to be honest. And, you know, a couple other things about Cleveland, some interesting things. Now the baby Ruth thing. Let's get into this. The candy bar thing is really skeptical. I had a good friend point this out to me, and it's very, very true. If you really think about it. Now, the company has generally claimed that it was named after Ruth Cleveland, baby Ruth Cleveland. But it was probably to actually avoid paying Babe Ruth royalties. Let, let's look at the timeline of this all, okay? In 1897, Grover Cleveland leaves office. In 1904, Ruth Cleveland, baby Ruth, she dies. In 1920, 16 years after baby Ruth Cleveland dies, 1920, Babe Ruth goes to the Yankees and he upends baseball by hitting 54 home runs that year, which was more than all the non-Yankee teams combined that season. And then the next year in 1921, the candy bar changes the name to Baby Ruth. Uh, a little fishy, no? Does anybody find this a little peculiar? <laughs> I mean, I certainly do. Um, I, I think it's a little odd. Uh, may maybe other people don't, but I definitely think it's a little odd. Uh, maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, another thing, as I touched on earlier too, Grover Cleveland had surgery for cancer while he was president, but it was kept secret for many years. In 1893, Cleveland contacted the White House doctor about soreness and an ulcer on the roof of his mouth. Afraid to cause a panic or worsen the economic depression, Grover Cleveland underwent a secret surgery to remove the tumor. Originally diagnosed as being benign, it was discovered in the 1980s that the growth had actually been a malignant cancer. Cleveland did live for many years after the surgery, and as I said, he was basically gone and disappeared uh, from the spotlight and from public eye for like three or four weeks, and there was never even an uproar uh, given about it. Um, pretty crazy. Um, I don't know. It's, it's pretty interesting stuff. You know, after uh, Grover Cleveland's second term did end, he retired to Princeton, New Jersey, and he basically retired from active political life. He became a member of the Board of Trustees of Princeton University here in New Jersey, and he continued to campaign for various Democrats. He also wrote for the Saturday Evening Post, he did, believe it or not. And on June 24th of 1908, Grover Cleveland died uh, of heart failure, and we're going to get into that here in a second. <clears throat> now, another really th cool thing that I always loved, and uh, it's a cool little story I wanted to just mention to everybody. All right, this story I love, and then I'll, I'll leave you with this before we get into the death and the burial of Cleveland. So, you know, it's a common desire. Many parents secretly hope their child grows up to become president of the United States. The odds are long, but it never hurts to dream, right? However, one day back in the spring of 1887, a man who actually had the job made a very strange wish, and he had no idea what fate had in store for the child that he wished it upon. 
You know, Grover Cleveland was a lot of things. He was the fattest guy elected president until, of course, William uh, Howard Taft. He was the only man to serve two non-consecutive terms, which forever screwed up the presidential numbering system. He was president number 22, lost a re-election bid for president 23, and then was re-elected four years later. So he was 22 and 24. Um, Pretty interesting stuff. Cleveland was from New York State, and he had a good friend named James. James lived in the Hudson River Valley, came from an old family, and was socially well-connected. He was a wealthy businessman who dealt in coal and railroads. In the mid-1880s, James sank a lot of money into a partnership that wanted to build a canal across Panama. This was 20 years prior to when the U.S. actually did it. He needed Washington's help in persuading Nicaragua which controlled Panama back then, to let them dig. And that meant lots of lobbying with Congress and the Grover Cleveland administration. So James decided to make a long visit to D.C., to Washington, D.C. He, his wife, and their five-year-old son, Frank, spent their first six months of 1887 in a rented house on the then-fashionable K Street in Washington. In between all his whining and dining, as he smooshed congressmen and bureaucrats, James also paid several purely social calls on his buddy, Grover Cleveland, in the White House. How good friends were they? Well, a year earlier, the 49-year-old Cleveland had married Francis Folsom, his uh, 21-year-old wife. The union made a lot of presidential history. Cleveland was the first president to get married while in office the only president to get married in the White House itself, and Francis became the youngest first lady in American history. Uh, Jackie Kennedy, who actually was 31, is the second youngest. And there, on a prominent White House fireplace mantle, sat the splendid clock that James had given the couple as a wedding gift. So when I say James and Grover were buddies, trust me, they were tight. So here we go, back to our story. James' extended stay in Washington was coming to a close, so he hit Grover Cleveland up for one small but very personal favor. He wanted to bring his young son Frank to the White House to meet and talk with the president. Sure, Grover Cleveland said. Bring him by late tomorrow afternoon. So James and Frank went to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and waited outside the door of Cleveland's second floor office. It turned out that Grover Cleveland was having a particularly stressful day. And when the, he finally came out of his office, he was visited. Uh, he was visibly weary. James introduced his son Frank, and they shook hands. Then Cleveland said something very odd to the young boy James. He patted the child's head and said, My little man, I'm making a strange wish for you. May you never grow up to be President of the United States. And at age five, Frank had already had a knack for selectively ignoring what he was told. And he apparently did so this time. Because 46 years later, Frank was elected president and re-elected and re-elected and re-elected. Frank, as you've probably already guessed it, was indeed Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So not only did Cleveland pick the wrong boy for his strange wish... He picked the one who would serve as president longer than anyone else. So how is that for irony? Uh, And here's the more ironic thing that I love about this story. It's my favorite part of the story, to be honest. He told Franklin Roosevelt this when he was five years old in 1887. Yeah, 1887. During Grover Cleveland's first term in the White House. So this wasn't even after he was not reelected and then got reelected again four years later. This was not during his second term when there was an economic depression happening in the country and he was not doing well and failing and probably under tremendous stress during that economic depression of uh, the Panic of 1893. This was during his first term as president (laughs) that he told this to a young Franklin Roosevelt. So, awesome story. Love it. Think it's great. Thought I'd share it. So, there you go. Presidency and a look at kind of the life 
of Grover Cleveland. And now we're going to get into, as we always do, the death and the burial site of the president. Again, as I always like to point out, I will be reading directly from the book, The President is Dead by Louis Pacone. Louis Pacone's book, The President is Dead, is phenomenal. I have said this probably on about four or five of my videos over the last few months. I will say it again. Um, a wonderful book. It is the best presidential death and burial sites and gravesite book I've ever, ever read. I love it. Uh, he just came out. Louis Pacone did the author with a new book on Grant's tomb just about a month ago. Do yourselves a favor. If you love this presidential history, especially if you love this death stuff, you know, where they died and, you know, where where they're buried and how they're buried there and why, please go pick up The President is Dead by Louis Pacone. You will not be disappointed. So here we go. Reading from The President is Dead. During the last two years of his life, Grover Cleveland suffered from multiple medical ailments, including gastrointestinal heart and kidney disease. The former president was a private man and chose to deal with his health issues as such. In March of 1908, Cleveland, who had been living in Princeton, New Jersey for more than a decade, went to recuperate at the Lakewood Hotel in southern New Jersey's Lakewood, New Jersey, which, by the way, is about two minutes from my house, and I will show you that. But even under constant medical care, his condition continued to deteriorate. He longed for his home in Princeton, and he returned in late May of 1908. By mid-June, with Cleveland's health improved, his children left for the family summer home in Tamworth, New Hampshire. Things took a tragic turn when at 2 p.m. on June 23rd of 1908, he went into heart failure. His longtime friend and physician, Dr. Joseph D. Bryant, came from New York along with lung specialist George R. Lockwood. They arrived at the home at 4.24 p.m. where they joined Cleveland's family physician, Dr. John M. Karnakin, or Karnashin. Unfortunately, there was little they could do. That night, Grover Cleveland lay in his second floor front bedroom and drifted in and out of consciousness. Much of what he mumbled was inaudible, but his final recorded words were, I have tried so hard to do right. As a two-time president with a reputation as one of the most honest men to ever hold office, indeed he had. At about 6.30 a.m., he fell unconscious for the last time. Grover Cleveland died two hours later at 8.40 a.m. on Wednesday, June 24th of 1908. Along with his three doctors, his wife Frances was also at his bedside at the final moment. His doctors released a statement, heart failure complicated with pulmonary thrombosis and edema were the immediate cause of death. Later that night, a death mask was made by sculptor Edward Wilson. The mask startled those that had not seen Cleveland in a while. It showed how frail and, frail and withered the once robust president had become as he had lost almost 100 pounds in the later years of his life. The Toledo News lamented, it shows Cleveland had failed greatly since the last published photos of him were taken. The newspaper continued, wasting at the temples and just below the cheekbones betray the falling away that resulted from Mr. Cleveland's disease. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, now with no living predecessors, was about to leave for New London, Connecticut when he learned of Cleveland's death. He immediately canceled his plans and he made arrangements to travel to Princeton, New Jersey. Teddy Roosevelt also issued a proclamation in which he called for 30 days of mourning and praised Cleveland's post-presidency years. Since his retirement from the presidency, he has continued to serve his countrymen by the simplicity, dignity, and and uprightness of his private life. Um, pretty pretty interesting stuff. So, um, now the day after his death, Cleveland's body was embalmed and placed in an oak casket with silver handles in the second floor bedroom where he died. Upon the casket was a silver plate with the plain inscription, 
Grover Cleveland, March 18th of 1837 to June 24th of 1908. On Friday, June 26th, simple services were held in the Cleveland home. Visitors began to arrive in Princeton, New Jersey around 2 p.m. on trains specially arranged for the occasion. Close friends and family made their way there, and as the New York Times reported, the most intimate slipped upstairs for a last look at the face of their departed friend, white and composed in death. Those not as close with the former president went to the Princeton Inn to wait for the funeral to start at 5 p.m. Before all the guests had arrived, the lid was closed and the coffin was carried downstairs to a reception room and adorned with floral arrangements. President Teddy Roosevelt and the First Lady arrived from Oyster Bay, New York, and were met at the station by New Jersey Governor John Franklin Fort. Arriving after the casket had been sealed, Roosevelt was denied a final look upon his predecessor. He offered his condolences to Francis, who turned 44 the next month, and he promptly took his seat. There were about 100 people in attendance, filling the reception room and spilling into the adjo uh, adjoining library. <clears throat> at 5 p.m., the widow entered wearing a black veil and dress. Reverend Sylvester W. Beach of the First Presbyterian Church of Princeton, where the Clevelands worshipped, read the committal service. Um, pretty interesting stuff. And then eventually the pallbearers carried the coffin to the hearse and walked beside it to the cemetery. Five minutes after the service ended, the 26th carriage procession was already in motion. In the seventh carriage rode President Roosevelt, followed by four secret servicemen. It passed flags at half-mast, and homes and businesses decorated in mourning, the latter ordered closed by the mayor and town council. All was silent, save for the tolling bells from Nassau Hill. No military bands were playing. Nearly the entire Princeton population of 5,000 was scattered beyond, behind ropes along the route, heads bowed, and hats in hand. A much larger crowd had been expected. Out of concern that they might not be able to handle the masses, the small Princeton police force had been augmented by National Guardsmen from all over the state. Their task, as the New York Times reported, was to handle the great crowd that was expected. However, as the Times continued, they did not come. For three quarters of a mile, the procession wound its way through Princeton from Bayard Lane to Nassau Street to Van Vandervender Avenue and then to Wigan Street until it reached the entrance to the Princeton Cemetery. So there you go. Now what about the death sites? The Lakewood Hotel, where Cleveland went to recuperate before his death, was constructed in 1891 by a group led by Nathan Strauss. It was built on 14 acres from Clifton Avenue to Lexington Avenue in Lakewood, New Jersey. Despite its proximity to the beach, the hotel's high season occurred during the winter when it served as headquarters for the New York politician, New York political machine, Tammany Hall. Cleveland arrived at the tail end of the season, but the hotel graciously stayed open to accommodate the former president. In later years, it was used as a rest and rehabilitation center for wounded World War I soldiers. So I'm going to show you some pictures and some video of where the um, Clifton Avenue and Lexington Avenue and Lakewood are. Um, obviously, this doesn't stand still the Lakewood Hotel, but you can kind of get an idea of where it was at. Hey guys, TJ with Dead History here. So I am actually standing on, uh, it's a parking lot. I actually think it's actually a municipal parking lot now. Um, but I am right on the spot, at least I'm um, 98% positive of it, of where the Lakewood Hotel was at that Grover Cleveland came to 
to kind of recuperate from not feeling well and being ill. Uh, he spent some time here very shortly before he actually went back to Princeton, New Jersey and died. Um, so he was here within the last couple of months of his life. Uh, as I touched on when I was reading uh, the excerpt from the President is Dead book. So I'll flip you guys around. So this is the parking lot, you know, it's just an empty parking lot here. Um, it's like a big municipal parking lot. Now it did say it was uh, built on 14 acres, uh, the Lakewood Hotel. And it said it was between Clifton Avenue and Lexington Avenue in Lakewood, New Jersey. Now, you will see here in a second as I safely cross this road that right now I am on Clifton Avenue. Um, and this Clifton Avenue is also known as 9th Street. So just for anybody with confusion. So here is the corner of Lexington and Clifton, which basically would have been like, like I said, this empty lot. And... These apartment buildings look like they've been here, obviously not since 1908, but they've probably been here for 40 years or so. So I don't think it was over here on this side. Um, I think it probably would have been on this side because this is where Lexington and Clifton meet. So, you know, if you're heading in that direction, you're on Lexington. You head that way, you're on Lexington, but you're heading away from Clifton. Uh, you know, down there is not Clifton. So this is Clifton here, uh, you know, 9th Street, AKA also Clifton Avenue. Um, here, I'm gonna cross over again. So I would assume just for, uh, you know, the sake of sake of argument, I would assume that it was, it, it sat on this property here where this municipal parking lot is. Now, if anybody knows any different, uh, if there's anybody, historians or, Maybe even local New Jersey people who know different of where the Lakewood Hotel used to sit. Um, please let me know, but I would assume that it was in here somewhere. Again, this is Clifton here that runs, and then that over here is Lexington. Again, if we go that way, we're heading away from Clifton. You know, here would be basically where it would have to be. So, anyway, I would say it's generally, as I just kind of do a the whole like 360. I would say it's generally in this general vicinity is where uh, it was located. If I if I had to guess, so there uh, there you have it. Uh, the location of where the Lakewood Hotel most likely was back in 1908 when Grover Cleveland came here and stayed here. Um, you know, very shortly before he passed away uh, back in his home in Princeton, New Jersey. So. Thanks for joining, guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now. Hey, guys. So I had to come back and correct myself a little because I just looked at my map again. So this right here is Cliff, um, Lexington. Let me flip you around. This is all Lexington Avenue, okay? That was that corner that I was just at, 9th and Cl uh, Lexington. And I said that 9th Street is technically Clifton. I was, I'm not correct on that. 9th Street basically intersects with Clifton. But this is all Lexington Avenue. And then if you look down here where I'm gonna go, it actually, so straight ahead, that block down there that runs parallel, that's Clifton. So it said it was built from Clifton to Lexington. So that would have been Clifton down here, okay? And then Lexington right here. So I would assume, as I said, it definitely is this municipal complex parking lot is where it was. Um, I don't think that there's any way that it was where those apartments are, you know, because that's 9th Street, you know, and even though, yeah, Lexington's here and Cl uh, Clifton's out here, I guess it's possible, but I'm going to say it was probably right here, I would assume. Uh, maybe over where those apartments were, but again, I'm going to assume it was in here. So there you go. Corner of, uh, well, 9th Street right here, Clifton Avenue parallel here, Lexington Avenue parallel here. Again, probably right in here somewhere. Thanks, guys. I just wanted to clear that up. Bye-bye. 
Now, the uh, two-and-a-half-story colonial-style home where Cleveland died is located at 15 Hodge Road in Princeton, New Jersey. In 1896, the Clevelands visited Princeton for their historic college's 150th anniversary and were enthralled with the small town and their warm reception. With the recommendation and encouragement of friend Andrew West, the Clevelands retired to Princeton after his term in 1897. The modest home was painted white and surrounded by pine trees, and in honor of his friend, he named the home Westland. Cleveland was well received in the town. Students marched to his home to celebrate football victories and gathered at Westland to serenade him on his birthday. For years, he remained active and delivered an occasional lecture at the university. He was also awarded an honorary degree from the prestigious college. After his death, several other families owned the home, and it remains a private residence to this day. There have been a number of changes to the home, both interior and exterior. The home was recently owned by the Ciprell family, who hung a portrait of Cleveland in their billiard room. And in 2010, the owner told a reporter for the local US-1 newspaper, I sleep in the room that Glover, Grover Cleveland died in. I've become fascinated with his life story. If you visit, please keep in mind it is a private residence and not open to visitors. But what I'm going to show you here is that home where Grover Cleveland died, where he lived, right there in Princeton, New Jersey. So here's some pictures and uh, video of that. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History, and welcome. Uh, it is Monday, April 12th of 2021. It's a rainy, kind of chilly spring day here in New Jersey, and I am in Princeton, New Jersey. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn you guys around right now, because we are approaching the home at 15 Hodge Road here in Princeton, New Jersey, where Grover Cleveland the 22nd and the 24th president of the United States died and lived, of course, and there it is. That was his house right there. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, really cool stuff, actually. So, yeah, this is it right here. 15 Hodge Road. This is where Cleveland died at. He died up in the uh, upstairs bedroom up there. Um, back in 1908 and uh this this was his home it's pretty cool stuff sorry about sorry about that guys the uh video shut off for some reason but there you go he died in upstairs bedroom i believe it was whoa whoa hi there i believe it was that bedroom right up there i believe i could be wrong it's either that side or the other side um but this is the westland mansion where grover cleveland lived and died so there you go, here in Princeton, New Jersey. Thanks for stopping in, guys. So now, last but not least, the Princeton Cemetery, where he's buried. Princeton Cemetery is on the corner of Wiggins and Witherspoon Streets. It was established in 1757 on a single acre of land purchased by Princeton University, then known as the College of New Jersey. It was purchased from Judge Thomas Leonard. Additional acreage was added in 1801 when Dr. Thomas Wiggins donated his farm situated adjacent to the cemetery. Um, the area designated as the president's plot is for the former presidents of Princeton University. All but four are buried here, actually, and not where Cleveland is buried. Cleveland's grave, marked number 11 on the cemetery map, is near Witherspoon Street between Quarry and Green Streets. Like the man... It is not ostentatious and does not stand out in the cemetery. It can be easily spotted as, as it is covered in coins and Hawaiian shell necklaces. The former can be found on many presidents' graves for the same reason people used to place coins on the deceased eyes. The later 
the latter I should say, are offered because Cleveland is universally admired by natives of the Aloha State for having opposed the annexation of Hawaii and following a policy of non-intervention during both of his administrations. Um, really cool. Yeah, it's not much. There's not much to Cleveland's grave. The obelisk is pretty basic. It's not super tall. Um, I don't know exactly how many feet. I would say maybe seven to eight feet tall. It's not very tall. Um, there's nothing to it. There's no mention of him being president on his obelisk or his gravesite. Uh, baby Ruth's buried there. Um, it's, it's just kind of, you know, it's just kind of blah. Uh, I love it because, you know, it's right here in Princeton, New Jersey, and it's our only New Jersey president, but there's really not much to it, I can assure you. So, um, there it is. That is the burial site at the Princeton Cemetery of the 22nd and 24th president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. Cleveland. Awesome and a very interesting fact is maybe 50 to 75 yards from where Grover Cleveland is buried in the same cemetery is Vice President Aaron Burr and right next to Aaron Burr is Declaration of Independence signer John Witherspoon. So literally about 50 yards or so from where Grover Cleveland is buried in the same cemetery you have a vice president and a Declaration of Independence signer. So if you're ever in New Jersey, especially in Princeton, New Jersey, go check out the uh, house that Cleveland died at and be sure to definitely check out the Princeton Cemetery. It is definitely enriched in history. You know, you have three very, very prominent uh, political figures and uh, historical figures buried there, as I just said. Uh, so go check it out. I love it. It's a really quaint, nice cemetery, beautiful cemetery. Just about every dead U.S. president, vice president, and signer of the Declaration of Independence. And one day after a few weeks of being inside, locked down, I just started Googling things. I actually Googled famous grave sites in New Jersey. But New Jersey could not contain his curiosity. From Illinois to Kansas, from Massachusetts to New Mexico, from Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln to Millard Fillmore and William Henry Harrison, he visited 37 of the 39 presidential graves. VPs, he made it to 41 of 42, and 53 of the 56 declaration signs. Hey again guys, TJ with Dead History, and I am actually here at the Princeton Cemetery in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, it's April 12th of 2021. I just went and saw the house where Grover Cleveland lived in Princeton and died at. Uh, now I'm here at the cemetery where he's buried. I've been here several times, and if you watch that little news clip, uh, it was like a two and a half minute clip of me. This is the cemetery I was walking around with with the reporter. Um, and the cool thing about Princeton Cemetery, let me flip you guys around. I was actually looking at it. This was the very first gravesite I ever went to last year in 2020 um, that started my journey of exploring all these historical gravesites of these historical people all throughout the country. It was this cemetery I came and saw Grover Cleveland's grave. The only other presidential gravesite I'd ever been to when I was young was John F. Kennedy's in Arlington, Virginia, and George Washington's in Virginia. 
that was it. Um, I'd never been to Cleveland right here in my home state of New Jersey. So Cleveland is right over there. If you can actually see, boop, that's the top of his obelisk right there. So this was the very first gravesite I was ever at last year that started that journey of what I did. And the really cool thing about this is that was the exact date was April 25th of 2020. And today's April 12th of 2021. So almost a year to the day almost um, of when I started this journey. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. And right here, folks, is the gravesite of the 22nd and 24th president of the United States, Grover Cleveland, New Jersey's own. So here you go. There is President Cleveland's grave right here, as you see. Like I said, not much to it, you know, just basically says born, died, no mention of the presidency outside of these little flags. As uh, I had read and touched on from the President is Dead book, you see these Hawaiian shells and such that adorn the top of his obelisk. Um, that, of course, is, you know, due to the annexation of Hawaii that Cleveland was uh, obviously an integral part of when he was president. Uh, and then here you go. Here is Baby Ruth. That is Ruth Cleveland. Baby Ruth. And also, there is uh, Mrs. Cleveland, Francis Folsom Cleveland. So, Baby Ruth and Francis Folsom Cleveland, the wife of Grover Cleveland, buried right here next to him. Um, and then this is Francis Folsom Cleveland Preston, daughter of Oscar Folsom and Emma Harmon Folsom. Actually, I take that back. I think this is actually um, Cleveland's wife. Maybe I'm wrong. It's either that one. I got to check that, and I'll put it on the screen. But there you go. So pretty cool stuff. There it is. The Princeton Cemetery and the gravesite of Grover Cleveland. Guys, back around, and there you have it. So almost a year to the day uh, after I started this journey, and here I am back again at the uh, Perry. Uh, pretty fun stuff. Pretty cool. So I'll probably show you guys real quick where if in conjunction to President Cleveland's grave, right back, like right over there through those trees, that is where Aaron Burr and John Witherspoon are buried. And I'll take a look at that for you and take a quick video for everybody. So here you go. The beautiful picturesque or picturesque, if you will, uh, Princeton Cemetery here in Princeton, New Jersey. And Grover Cleveland. Thanks, guys. So real quick, I just wanted to touch on that because I just read it more because I wasn't reading it like a silly person. So this is just Baby Ruth. This is Baby Ruth here, daughter of Grover Cleveland and Francis Folsom Cleveland. That is the infamous Baby Ruth, who supposedly the candy bar is named after. Here's her father, President Grover Cleveland, of course, as I said. And then this is... Mrs. Cleveland, Francis Folsom Cleveland Preston, because remember, she did remarry uh, later on uh, after Grover Cleveland had died. She was the uh, first um, widowed first lady to ever remarry. So there you go. That's Mrs. Cleveland, President Cleveland, and baby Ruth. So there you go. Hey guys, TJ back with around. So you can kind of see behind me. Whoop, where am I at? Boop, boop, boop. Right back there. Right back there. Huh? Like right there is Grover Cleveland's grave. Okay? That's how close I am to where I'm taking you now to Aaron Burr and John Witherspoon. So, I mean, like I told you, 50 yards? I don't even know if it is 50 yards, to be completely honest. So right here is the gravesite of Vice President Aaron Burr who obviously was famous for not only being vice president, but also involved in that very, very famous duel between himself and Alexander Hamilton, where he shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. He was Thomas Jefferson's uh, vice president. So there you go, the gravesite of vice president and famous dueler Aaron Burr. And again, if you can look in conjunction, here's Burr's, and like Cleveland's like right back over there. I mean, it's really pretty close like right back a little past that other one there not far at all and then look if you look here here's burr and 
right here next to Burr is John Witherspoon, Declaration of Independence signer John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon, of course, was um, one of the Declaration of Independence signers. He was also, uh, I believe, yes, he was. He was uh, one of the presidents of Princeton College. So right here is John Witherspoon's gravesite as well. So there you go. You got John Witherspoon here and Aaron Burr there and Grover Cleveland back there. That is how... <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. I cut off, but John Witherspoon right here behind me. Aaron Burr. Boop. And then Grover Cleveland up uh, back that way. Pretty cool stuff here at the Prairie. The very historic Princeton Cemetery here in Princeton, New Jersey. So, hope everybody enjoyed that. Thanks, guys. So, there you have it, folks. The life, the legacy, the presidency, the death and the burial site of our only New Jersey native son to be president. The man who's the only one to do two non-consecutive terms, number 22 and 24, Grover Cleveland. I hope you enjoyed this look at Grover Cleveland's life and legacy. And of course, stay tuned because next week we will be covering the 23rd president of the United States, Benjamin Harrison. So stay tuned for that. Thanks as always for all the support. Thank you for all you guys do. The comments and questions, please keep them coming. We love it. And uh, yeah, can't thank you guys enough. And we will see you next week. Be well. Stay safe. See you then. Bye-bye, guys.